This is Jay Rogers. I'm the director of the Forerunner. And in this video, this is now part three of my review of an earlier playlist I did, which was eight videos uh, reviewing my book on the prophecy of Daniel and Preterist perspective, the easy parts and the hard parts. We haven't gotten to Daniel 2 yet, but I thought before we would do that, I'm kind of experimenting with this new format. And I thought I would just review the earlier playlist. If you want to see all the videos in the earlier playlist, I have the link below. Okay, so this is the um, chiastic structure, recapitulation, and parallelism are names for a device in Hebrew poetry. And basically what this is, is it's repetition. Okay, In order for people to remember things in ancient times when they told things orally or when things were supposed to be repeated and memorized, they would often use repetition. Uh, that's used today as well. But there are thousands of examples in scripture of parallelisms, chiasms, and so on. And to really understand Daniel, sometimes when you read a verse and you read the second verse, the second verse is saying the same thing as the first verse. It's just saying it in different language. So if you want to understand what the language is saying in one place, you can look at it in the second place or the third place where it's repeated. Otherwise, you're looking at things in isolation and you're interpreting things differently than the way the author intended it. Okay, so what is chiastic structure? What is recapitulation? And what is parallelism? Okay, parallelism is when a structure is repeated. It's not simply just repeating words, but it's repeating the structure of the words. For instance, uh, there's a famous phrase from the Gettysburg Address that says, this government of the people, by the people, for the people. You notice that that's a parallelism. It's similar words are repeated. A reverse parallelism is when you repeat something, but in the reverse order. It's also called a chiasm. And a parallelism over longer passages is called recapitulation, or if it's a reverse parallelism over a longer passage, it's called chiastic structure. Uh, the entire book of Daniel is actually arranged in chiastic structure. In chapter one, we have the Babylonian siege and the destruction of the temple. Then in chapter two is A, there are four world empires, okay? And chapter seven is also A, there are four world empires. In chapter 3, we hear the story of the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, furnace. And in chapter 6 is also B, we hear about Daniel in the lion's den. Chapter 4 is the humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar. And chapter 5 is the overthrow and the death of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. And so chapters 2 through 7 are historical narratives and prophecies. And they're written in the Chaldean language, which is related to Hebrew, but it was the language of Babylon. Then in the second chiasm, chapter 8 is about Persia and Greece, that's A. And chapter 11, 1 through 35 is also A. That's also about Persia and Greece. Chapter 9, 1 through 24 is intercessory prayer. And chapter 10 is intercessory prayer, that's B. Chapter 9 kind of hinges on one verse, but the first part of chapter 9 is a decree for Jerusalem to be rebuilt at C, and chapter 9, verse 27, is the decree for Jerusalem to be destroyed and the temple desecrated. And then in the middle of this chiasm is one verse where the Messiah is to be cut off. And not only is that the, the hinge of Daniel, but it's the hinge of all history is the cross when Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sin and that changed world history. So all of chapter 8 through 12 are all prophecies and there is also um, some intercessory prayer that's part of the prophecy. All right, so what's a chiasm? Well, first concept A is mentioned once, then concept B is mentioned twice. So it goes A, then B, B, and then A again. The structure ends with a final A. And we use these little... Um, marks there to show that it's the second time, or you could say BB as well. Okay, the best example of this is from the book of Genesis. Genesis has lots and lots of chiasms, probably more than any other book in the Bible. And I just wanted to mention that 
people have always known about this kind of parallel structure since ancient times, but it became really popular about 100 years ago or maybe 150 years ago in the, in the 1800s. And then recently, in the last few years, it's become very popular to go into the Bible and find all the places where there's repetition, chiastic structure, and so on. So it's always been there and it's always been known about, but people have really gotten into learning about it. So Abel and Cain in Genesis 4, there's a description of their names, their occupations, and their offerings. And this is how this goes. We have A, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the, the ground. So notice that A is about Cain and B is about Abel. Then the process repeats again. In the process of time, it came to pass. Cain brought an offering. Then B, Abel also brought an offering. And the Lord respected Cain and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So I'm just moving quickly here, but you can see how it moves from Abel to Cain, Abel, excuse me, Cain first, then Abel twice, then Cain again, then Cain again, then Abel twice, and then finally with Cain. And that is the parallel structure of Genesis chapter 4. So this is what we see again in the chiastic structure of Daniel. Same kind of structure, but we're, we've added a C in the middle. And this is the chiastic structure of Daniel 2 through 7. Um, Daniel 2, there's four parts of the statue. In Daniel 7, there's four beasts. And so we see that four world empires and four world empires, chapters 2 and 7. In the next chapter, chapter 3, we have the children in the fiery furnace, and then we have Daniel in the lion's den. That's the cover of my book. So you get the idea from this. In chapter 4, there's the humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar. And then this is the overthrow of Belshazzar. So you have kind of two kings being humiliated by God. And that's right in the middle of that chiasm. Okay, moving on to 51. Okay, there we go. Um, this is the parallel structure again. Notice that in the very beginning, there's the overthrow of the temple. And then the very end of Daniel also by the Babylonians first. And at the very end of Daniel, it's the Romans that overthrow the temple. This is Daniel 8, deals with a ram and a he-goat, which are Medo-Persia and Greece. A king of fierce countenance shall a king of fierce countenance shall destroy the mighty whole holy people and stand up against the prince of princes. That speaks of the a Greek king. And then Daniel 11, a vile person who sets up the abomination of, temp of desolation in the temple of God. That's also a Greek king. It's actually a, Seleu a Seleucid king. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. And he committed an abomination of desolation prior to AD 70, back in 167 BC. So it was kind of like a little foreshadowing of the, the later abominations. All about the trials and tribulations of the, the Jewish people throughout history trying to comfort them to stay stay faithful and wait for the Messiah. It's the whole point of the prophecy of Daniel. So we have that there, Persia and Greece, and then Persia and Greece. Okay. And okay, if we look at the entire thing from beginning to end, this is what it looks like. It's two, it's a double chiasm. And the first chapter is in Hebrew, followed by the Chaldean language. And then the second chiasm is all in Hebrew. And it's it's uh, the bookends are the temple destruction. And the, um, the hinge here is the overthrow of pagan kings. And the hinge here is the Messiah, the king of kings, who came for the remission of sin. 
Okay, so why do we have trouble reading Daniel? Well, Greek philosophy influenced us to think more linear, linearly. So, so we're all European thinkers in America, even if you're not European, that's been our schooling. And so uh, Greek philosophy is logical. It goes from A to B to C and then therefore D. But many ancient people didn't think linearly, but more circularly or in parallel structure or in mini chiasms, right? So the mini chiasms are like, you go in one direction, then you go in the opposite direction. You go forward to the end and then back to the beginning again. All right, so the example of this is, uh, of this chiasm is, um, there's a vile person in Daniel eleven twenty one, And who is this person? Well, you have these northern and southern kingdoms throughout Daniel chapter, chapter 11. The northern kingdom is Syrian Antioch, is the capital, and that's the Seleucid Empire. And then the Ptolemaic Empire is Egypt. And then in the middle of that, you have Judea. And all during this period, there was a war over this area, which is called Coal Syria, or basically what we would know today as Israel or Palestine. And the Jews were right in the middle, and they were taking the land back and forth. Like there are wars between the Ptolemaic kings and the Seleucid kings throughout Daniel chapter 11. So Daniel 11.28 has four clauses that form a mini chiasm. And if you don't read them correctly, if you read them linearly, right, you'll get the wrong interpretation. If you don't read them as a reverse chiasm, you won't understand it. In chronological order, this is something that was actually fulfilled in history. In chronological order in 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes attacked Jerusalem. And then on his way, he lost, by the way. He was met there by the Romans, and they it was basically kind of like putting a stop to the Seleucids, just running all over the world and doing what they wanted. So Roman officials showed up. They stopped them. And on his way home from the failed campaign in Egypt, right, he turned, returned to Syria. So he attacked the city of Jerusalem, desecrated the temple. It's kind of like a temper tantrum for having lost that campaign. And then at the very end of it, he goes back to Syria. All right, so this is how this goes. Then he shall return to the land with great riches. So Antiochus returned home to Syria from Egypt. And his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, which means that on his way home, he plundered the temple. And he shall do exploits, meaning, what does that mean? Well, it means the same thing as, right, this part right here. He was against the Holy Covenant. He did something against the place where the covenant was, you know, where the covenant was enforced was in the temple. That was the, the judicial seat of God in the Holy of Holies. So he plunders the temple. He shall do exploits. means the same thing. He would plunder the temple. And then he returned to his own land. He returned to Syria. Now, if you read this linearly, just in order, right? So basically, this is what happens. He starts in Syria. He goes to Ptolemaic Egypt. He stops in Jerusalem, in Judea, he plunders the temple and returns to Syrian Antioch. All right, now if you read it linearly, right, he shall return to his own land with great riches, which means he returns home to Syria from Egypt, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. On his way home, he plundered the temple, and he shall do exploits. Again, same thing, and return to his land. So it starts off with him returning to his land and ends up, with him returning to his land. If you're not careful, you will think that this goes in chronological order. So there's like two trips, trip one and trip two. But in reality, you should read it like this. All right. Then he shall return to his land with great riches. And then it repeats it again. He shall return to his own land. It's the same thing. It's just repeated twice. And then B and B means the same thing. It's just repeated another way. All right. So, and he shall do a great exploit. He shall do exploits means the same thing as the, the sacking of the temple, the plundering of the temple. Okay. All right. Um, this is the second thing I want to talk about is Daniel 244. This is the one that gives people tr <laughs> trouble. <laughs> they say that, 
um, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And they assume that's the second coming of Christ. But from the chiastic structure of Daniel, we know it's at Christ's first coming. If you think about it, um, the Old Testament prophets didn't really write about the second coming of Jesus because Jesus hadn't come yet. Right? So that hadn't really been revealed until the New Testament. All right, so if you look at this whole thing together, you see that you know Daniel 2 deals with the history from Babylon to the Roman Empire, and the same thing all the way through. So it's you have to go by context, in other words. All right, um, in Daniel 7, now this is another one that's confusing for people because Daniel 7 speaks of a little horn, and Daniel 8 also speaks of a little horn. A little one which came up among them, and the other horn that came up after them, another king will arise. So it's actually a, it's actually a king that comes up in the midst of the other horns. Uh, 24 says that after them, but the sense is, is that Daniel is seeing the horn rise and the vision after them, not that it's a horn that comes after them in chronological historical order because the first two times it's among them and in the midst of them, okay? And then in Daniel 8, 9 has similar language. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. So a lot of people will say, well, this is the Antichrist in the future and it's the same figure, but, right? What's the context? What's the context of Daniel 7, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom in the earth. This is the context of Daniel 7, the little horn. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom in the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. And shall devour the whole earth and trample it and break it in pieces. This is speaking of Rome's conquest of the earth. And then we see in Daniel 7 again, a little one shall come up among them. The vision seen in Daniel 1 through 14. Another one that came up. The vision's repeated, Daniel 7, 15 to 22. And after them, another king will arise. The vision's interpreted. So it's actually the same vision being interpreted, being repeated three times in different ways. The last time it's interpreted. And so if you read the verses separately, you can interpret them differently, but if you read them together, you understand they mean the same thing. And you get the interpretation in the last part. But if language is difficult in one part, read the other part and see if it makes it more clear. That's the, kind of like the guide there. Um, if, if there's a scripture that's difficult, look to the surrounding passages, the surrounding verses to see if it makes it clearer. And if it's still not clear, find another place in the Bible that has sig similar language. And it might mean the same thing. All right. And now this is um, Daniel 8. Out of one of them came another horn. So people would say, well, this is the same horn. It's describing the same thing. But what's the context of Daniel 8? Daniel 8 is the, the Greek kingdom. It's very, very specific that um, it says that this is Greece. It literally says that in the, in the chapter. So you can't just take... Daniel 8 out of context and say that it's the Antichrist or that it's Rome because Daniel 8 specifically says that the goat, the he goat with the horn that breaks off and four horns grow up in its place is the Greek kingdom, okay, the Greek empire. Same thing with Daniel 11, it takes place during the time of the Greek empire. The vile person is also Antiochus Epiphanes. So everything has to line up, it has to be. Uh, has to be um, consistent, okay? So I'm jumping all over the place here. Okay, and then in Daniel 11.36, then it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself among every god, and he shall speak marvelous thing against the god of gods. And this is the one, this is one of the hard parts of Daniel that confuses a lot of people. Who is this? Is this Antiochus Epiphanes? Is it the Pope? Is it... One of the Caesars, is this the Antichrist in the end times? Who is this king? And different schools of interpretation say it's different things. But what does the context say? Okay. There's recapitulation. Okay. This is the 
the Greek Empire, right? And this is the Roman Empire. They come back to back. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. All right. So my, yep, I'm not, I'm not going to get really into this, but my interpretation is, is that Daniel 11 shifts around, around verse 36. And this now is beginning to stop now is beginning to speak of Rome. And in a future video, I'll get into exactly why I believe it's Rome after verse 36. So remember recapitulation. Recapitulation is repetition. Parallel structure is um, when you line things up and it repeats. And a reverse parallelism is called a chiasm. Okay. So when is, when is the... The kingdom of God. It comes, the kingdom of God comes in the days of these kings. And by context, that is the Roman Empire, because it's the same time that the Messiah is born. In Daniel chapter 9, we get the exact date when the Messiah comes. This is another one I just thought I would throw him in there. This is describing who is this willful king. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, and he shall magnify himself above all. <coughs> Okay, so this is confuses people again because they read this one verse out of context, nor the desire of women. What does that mean? What does nor the desire of women mean? In futurism, it says nor the desire for women. They just change of to for, which can happen sometimes with prepositions. Prepositions can be more than one thing when you translate them. So in futurism, they say the Antichrist will be a homosexual, not desiring for women. Okay, so that's taken way out of context, but that's common. In historicism, the Roman Catholic Church would forbid marriage for priests through sacerdotal celibacy. Okay, again, nor the desire for women. And then in idealism, this one actually comes the closest, I think. Um, nor the desire of women, rejecting Christ as the desire of women and there's a little comparison in Haggai 2 7 and the desire of all nations shall come okay so that's saying that the uh this antichrist figure won't have any desire for Christ so he'll reject Christ but what does preterism actually say well not preterism so much but what does the structure say this is the same reverse chiasm that we see throughout um, much of Daniel chapter 11. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, for he shall magnify himself above all. That's two parallel ideas. And then B is in the middle, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. Okay, so what B means is that he's going to um, magnify himself and not re not have any regard for any other God except for himself. So the desire of woman would just mean like the, the gods that women worship. Um, this is, B is kind of parallel to A as well. The God of his fathers and the God of women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself. In other words, he's not gonna worship any of the gods, not the God of men, not the God of women, not any God, for he shall magnify himself. So you have to interpret B with B. And the whole thing has to be interpreted in context. It's just very simple. All it's saying is just that this is a man who is going to be so proud that he's going to rise above all other men and not even regard the God of his fathers or any God. The Greeks actually had a creator God that was one, one God, and then there were other gods as well. So, Okay. So that's, you have to interpret B with B, that's the point here. Uh, there's a couple of other things that are interesting from history, like for instance, if we read uh, the Roman historians, we find out that Nero had a 100 foot tall gold statue dedicated to his divinity. And then in Daniel, there was a 90 foot tall gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar made of himself in Daniel 3. So this isn't actually in the text, but it's just interesting that you have this figure of Nebuchadnezzar, and then later you have this figure of Nero, and they both had these giant gold statues built of themselves, which is just like kind of bizarre. 
uh, these statues were like almost the same height as the Statue of Liberty, and they were gold, according to history and according to the Bible. This one was gold plated. This one probably was gold plated too, but I believe that that's true. Okay. So pay attention to the rule of parallel structure. Uh, here's one final one. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So people take this verse. When's the time of the end? Well, the time of the end, the end times, they assume this is talking about the end times. Uh, at the end time, as many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. And I, I heard this growing up. This is a very common interpretation. All right, futurism says many shall run to and fro. It means that many in the end times will be able to travel long distances quickly using airplanes and helicopters. Using a satellite or a telephone cable to connect to the internet, you can search anything online and have results in seconds. I actually saw this as a uh, as an interpretation in a Bible online Bible commentary. Not a very professional, scholarly one, but that's what this is how people look at this. Okay, so let's look at this again. Now let's look at it in parallel structure. Okay, A B B and then A again. Okay, so if you look at it like this, okay, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. This is not a reverse chiasm, and this is just parallel structure. But thou, all Daniel, shut up the world and seal up the book even to the time of the end. So that's A and A. They mean the same thing. Shut up the words and seal up the book means the same thing. And when is the time of the end? Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. All right, what does that mean? Okay, I think that this is the Amplified Bible, and I'm not really crazy about the Amplified Bible, but in this particular case, they kind of get the meaning of the, the text. Many will go back and forth and search anxiously. In other words, go back and forth through the scroll, like look throughout the scroll, run back and forth, and knowledge of the purpose of God as revealed by his prophets will greatly increase. That's, that's what I believe that, that it's just the plain meaning of the text means that in the future, knowledge is going to increase and you know, just the knowledge of scripture is going to increase as we go forward into the future. Now, understand that from the time of Daniel, though, don't think of it in terms of 2023. Okay. Um, this is another one you need to look in parallel Daniel 11 35, Daniel 12 8 and 10 have similar language. Okay. It's parallel structure, it's repetition. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purif purify them, make them white until the time of the end. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Okay. So as we, this is another set of difficult verses, but the whole flow of Daniel 11 to 35, all the way through the end of chapter 12, is as the Jews move forward in history, some people would be wicked with no understanding, and some people would be righteous and that they, they would understand. Okay, so that's just my little um, review. This is my review of what the earlier playlist did, and so I kind of just wanted to do this as an experiment with a new system. I'm going to get into Daniel chapter two and then cover each one of the chapters in detail. And that's going to be the summary of my book, which is called, um, let's see if I can find this again real quick. This is a little bit glitchy, so here we go. The Prophecy of Daniel and Preterist Perspective, The Easy Parts and the Hard Parts by Jay Rogers. And you can get it online. Let's see if I can show you the... There we go. Okay. I got to get rid of these comments here. I'll put this down in the the review, but I'll put this down in the window below down on, on YouTube. So, all right. So this has been a half hour and I'm going to come back with other videos.
Okay, so we got a little bit, I'm playing with the system here. So, all right, God bless, and I will see you in a future video.